Okay. Um, this is Jocelyn Hall with the Ball State University Honors College Oral History Project. I'm here today on March 25th, 2019 in Muncie, Indiana. I'm talking with jo uh, Chris Fluke, a lecturer of TCOM, and I would like to start by asking where and when you were born. I was born here in Muncie, just across the street at Ball Memorial Hospital on May 7th, 1980. And can you tell me more about your childhood, what it was like growing up in Muncie? So I didn't really actually grow up in Muncie. Um, there was a, there's like a, at the time there was a no man's land between Muncie and Yorktown. And it was just like a residential addition. Now it's, as Yorktown has grown, it's been consumed. Um, so it's just like just outside of town, but it was really nice. It was like, um, it wasn't like a forested area, but it was more rural than what you would have in town. So we had a really big yard and a forest, like a, like a woods in the backyard. There were a lot of like events growing up. I looked up from the 80s, all the mm -hmm. things that were going on. So the f most interesting thing was the first cell phone was made in 1983, and then the first MacBook was made in 1984. So did any of that, when did you first experience those sort well, of? Well, in the 80s, the only people that had cell phones were doctors. And when I was in high school in the late 90s, the people, cell phones were considered drug paraphernalia because the only people that had cell phones were drug dealers and doctors. So you couldn't have a cell phone when you were in, when you were in uh, high school. So I did not have a cell phone. Our first family computer was an Apple IIe, which had a green screen and actual floppy disks. And we played like, um, um, uh, what's Oregon Trail and like really simple games, where in the world is Carmen San Diego, that kind of thing. They're like learning games that we had for it. So if you didn't have a lot of technology, what did you do when you were in your... So we had a big time? yard, so mm -hmm. uh, I spent a lot of time outside. Um, we had a garden at one point, and then it was big as like an acre and a half. I mean, the yard was an acre and a half. And then um, the woods behind the house wasn't, it wasn't our family's property, but we would, we would explore back there a lot and then when I got a little older I would ride my bike a lot of my friends lived in town on this 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 side of town so I would ride my bike up into around this area and we would just like go to McDonald's <laughs> it wasn't a whole lot to do <laughs> could you tell me more about your parents and your siblings and things like that yeah mom uh, was a teacher she taught at St. Mary's here in Muncie and then in I don't know, the late 90s, she uh, got a job at Union uh, High School, no, uh, Union Middle School High School. It's a little tiny town called Modoc, about 45 minutes away. And then my dad was an electrical engineer at uh, Westinghouse, which then became ABB, and they build like big transformers for um, like the electrical grid, and not only here in the United States, but around the world. So he would do that there, and then also he'd travel for a period in the in the like the mid late eighties, he'd go a lot to Venezuela and other countries, and just to like install these these transformers. So was he home a lot then, or was he out of town? Well, I mean, for <laughs> most of most of the time he was at home, but there were periods like the factory would they laid off a couple of times, and then he just he would get a job as like a freelance contractor, and he'd go to these places and then and set up. So the times that he was Traveling, he was traveling, but then the times he was here, he was he was here. So, was there ever any times where money was tight in your family? Or? So, yeah, there were there were periods in the early '80s that I I mean I don't think we were never poor, but there were times in the early '80s that I would say my family struggled because they were they were um, you know that was laid off, and mom up until I was about five or six did not work so. She taught for a few years and then took time off to raise me and my sisters and then um, went back to teaching in the late 80s. But I, I mean, there was a couple of years that were, that were difficult, but they, they made it. So in that um, aspect, did you ever, did you know that you're going to Ball State or to college during that time or were there doubts? There were never any questions about going to college. I mean, that was just the family was, was very adamant about that. I mean, I obviously wanted to. Um, for all kinds of reasons, um, but no, my parents and grandparents started putting money back the day I was born. They did the same thing for my sisters too. So, I mean, there wasn't a huge amount of money, but by the time I 
was ready to go to college, there was there was money in place to, to go. That's good. Um, so <clears throat> in your growing up years, um, what did you think about Ball State? Like, what, like, was it ever in your head? Did you know about yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, you, there's no way you could grow up in Muncie, at, that, at least at that time, without knowing about it. So um, my dad, he never finished, but he went to Ball State twice. It started um, when, for like environmental management, when he got out of the military, and then went back for computer science, but he never finished. My mom has a master's degree from the teacher's college and in an in undergraduate degree in the teacher's college. And went, I mean, so I mean, both my sisters went to Ball State, so it was just sort of a pervasive thing. And when I was in high school, it was, it was the uncool thing to do. So like, if you were gonna go to college and you went to Central or Yorktown or Westdale, you don't go to Ball State. You don't go to the townie school, you go to IU or Purdue. And so there was always, an, there, there was a bit of awkwardness, but Ball State had the, provided the best like scholarships for me. It made the most sense for what I wanted to do. It, it was then, it is now, has the strongest TCOM program compared to anybody else, really, not even just, just Indiana, but, but outside. And it just made a lot of financial sense. I did not want to, I mean, student loans are outrageous now, but they weren't, they weren't that much better when I went in the 90s. And I did not want to graduate with, you know, like $40,000 worth of debt if I went to some place in Southern California or whatever. Okay. Um, so then going back and talking about your experience in elementary school and middle school, what was that like for you? Like what sticks out to you? So I went to St. Mary's, which is a private Catholic school, again, just a couple blocks away from um, kindergarten through eighth grade. There was no high school, so then I transferred to uh, Yorktown. And a lot of people, I think, and I'm sure every Catholic school is different, but a lot of people give Catholic schools like a lot of crap. And um, I think it was, I think it probably prepared me better for education than anything else because the focus was on um, intellectual pursuits and it was, it was a, they had sophisticated, I think now, looking back, they had sophisticated curriculum. We learned, so when I got into high school, we were reading stuff in, as a sophomore that like we read in the seventh grade. You know, and it's nothing, it was terribly complex, but like I understood a lot, my high school was far easier for me than I think some of my peers, simply because there was so much that the, the, the school were preparing me for. And the nuns that always get shit on for slapping you on the back of hands with rulers. The nuns there were like saints. I mean, they were like wonderful women. And they left when about halfway through when I was in fourth or fifth grade, but my experience was, was great. Did that affect your religious principles now or? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know that I would identify as a Roman Catholic now, but like uh, I would absolutely. I mean, like I think my outlook even today is, is very much Roman Catholic and I there was there's no way you know you raise Baptist you sort of have that you know you, that perspective stays with you I think for a, a greater part of your life and uh, I think it a lot of my moral grounding I think it would be a mistake for me to say that it is, does not come ultimately from from the experience in the church but that not everything I mean I've I've gone completely in another in other directions on some issues that the Catholic Church teaches. And then in high school, was there any sort of honors curriculum, or and then did it in, was it influenced by your? Yep. Old so um, there was an honors curriculum, and I didn't in the freshman year. So Yorktown in middle school, they had like tracks, and I don't know what they have now, but the the more advanced students would be in one track, and then the students that you know like the, you know it seems shitty because it looks like a hierarchical system, but it was designed for the students that were able to to handle more advanced curriculum could do that. So when I got in as a freshman, they didn't know me. St. Mary's curriculum did not translate into to Yorktown. So they took they put me in like not remedial classes, but like the general classes. And I just got like I mean it was it was a joke. I mean my freshman I could have skipped, which probably sounds really arrogant, but like I could have skipped everything but my math classes in my freshman year in high school simply because I think St. Mary's did a good a good enough job. And then the, but they, the counselors realized that. So my sophomore year through my senior year, I got into the, the more honors classes. I was even president of the National Honor Society, our chapter in, in, in Yorktown. 
Do you think that reflects poorly on the quality of education at Yorktown? No, I just, I don't, I just don't think they knew. I think that you know, you have someone that's coming in from outside. You don't know. Their parents are going to say they're brilliant because everyone says their child's brilliant. I mean, I wasn't brilliant. I just, I think I, the, the St. Mary's, because the classes were so small, they were really able to better prepare the students. And I think they just didn't know. And so I, 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 don't, think, I don't think I lost anything by not being in the honors, honors classes my freshman year. So then tell me, what type of student were you? Did you get your homework done? Did mm -hmm. you go out and party? What, what, what did, did both. you do? So okay. like I was, but I never, I was a very good student. I mean, like I was, I always got my stuff done. Um, I always reserved time for, um, for, for making sure everything was complete. But yeah, I had a party too. So there's not a whole lot to do in Yorktown. Could you tell me like a typical day in the life of Chris Fluke at that time? I don't know. I mean, so I mean, you'd be, be in class through till three, and then I worked at McDonald's. The Meyer here in town had a McDonald's that was owned by a family friend or like managed by a family friend. So he got all of us jobs if we wanted to work. So I worked. I would go and I'd work at McDonald's for three or four hours, and then I and I did a terrible job. And then I would come home, and then you know, study or read or watch movies or whatever. I repeat the whole thing. I remember a lot, particularly my junior year of getting very little sleep because there were, uh, I mean, I was, I've never been very good at math, but I would dedicate time to it. I remember being up late, like a lot of nights going through like math problems. It was just terrible. And then when did telecommunications or video become a passion for you? Was it a movie that came out? No, I mean, I think, I don't think I really fully understood what I wanted to do. I, if, I, for a while, I wanted to be a mortician, and I don't know why. I just thought it was just like, I wanted to work in the medical community, but where the stakes weren't really that high. So like, if you, if you like botch, if you botch a, like a dead body, I know it sounds really macabre, but like, no one's going to die because they're already dead. But then I was like, I don't, that just sounds like a terrible thing. So, then I was really interested in radio. I think it's my great uncle create, uh, started a radio station here and always seemed like a really cool thing because it was a great blend of like technology but then storytelling and all that. And then I was more interested in the visual side of things. And I mean, that really came from, I don't know, there was really one thing, but in high school I went from, from wanting to be a mortician to, to, uh, to um, being, I and mean, that sounds like terrible. It sounds like totally weird. But then to, to wanting to be somewhere within like media in some capacity. So I don't think by the time, even when I got into college, I was like, I want to do this, this, or this. I just know that I wanted to do something that involved the technology with like storytelling. Did you have anyone who influenced you in the movie world, like David Letterman or someone who came from here? No, I mean, no. I mean, other than my great uncle being, you know, in radio, I don't know that there was any one thing. I've always, I think, been interested in how, how in, as a culture, we communicate our values in story. And I don't, I mean, we, I don't think what, what goes on now with, film or television is really any different than what's existed before with oral history or oral culture. It's just a different way. And the value, things that would be told in a church or around a campfire, we're doing the same exact thing. We're just doing it in, in, uh, with the, the available technology that exists. And then last question about your high school life. What, um, what was your like social life like? Did you have a lot of friends or were you close with your family somewhere? In so I uh, both. I mean, uh, my sister was off in college for part of it. Um, I mean, I've always been very close to my family, but, uh, Yorktown, I, and I don't know, I'm sure this is with every high school, but the, like they had like clicks and you know, like, and be, by the fact that I came from and I was an outsider. So I, you know, you do, <laughs> if you piss your pants in the second grade, that defines the rest of your time as you go through, right? Remember, that's Billy, they piss his pants, right? So, like, I didn't have any of that coming into it. So when I came into Yorktown, I was not part of anybody. So I actually, I, you know, I don't think I was, like, popular, but I had a lot of friends and a lot of different, like, cliques and groups because I, I just was sort of an outsider. And, um, I have people that hate their high school experience. Mine was wonderful. 
And then what kind of clubs were you involved in were you, outside of that one that you mentioned? I mean, that was it. I mean, the okay. Honor Society, and then um, I worked at McDonald's. And so, <laughs> other than school, that's pretty much all I did. Okay, so then as you went into Ball State, you mentioned that you had no groups or club involvement. Why did you never feel like getting involved in particular clubs? Well, I mean... I mean, what do you mean? Like, we had we had a chess club, and then there were sports, and there wasn't really anything. I mean, there wasn't really anything else to do. I mean, I had a good social life, I had a job, and I had school. I, I mean, there wasn't. I don't know that I really had time for anything else. Okay, so your time was taken up. Right. By studying, going. To I think work. I would have defined it then as as my time was taken up by all that stuff. And where did you live when you went to Ball State as a freshman? And going so through? freshman, I lived at home um, because I, that saved a lot of money. And then I lived in the sophomore year through my senior year. I moved to Colonial Crest, which sounds fancy, but it wasn't. It was a, an apartment complex off of sort of in between Muncie and Yorktown. So your freshman year, um, you you still worked at McDonald's? No. Oh, screw that. So, no, I worked at Menards. <laughs> I moved on up to the world. So, uh, yeah, and right right as I started school, I, I got a job at Menards and paid a little bit more, and they were far more flexible on hours. Plus, it was McDonald's. That's gross, you know, so. Do you eat there now? I do, yeah, breakfast. I mean, totally, you know. They have the best breakfast. Um, so, why did you attend to go to Ball State if it was seen as something that was not well, they gave, me the, they gave me the best deal. I mean, they really gave me a very good deal in terms of my, the scholarships. It had the best program. In terms of the state schools, I got into IU and Purdue. I got into um, UCLA. Um, I got into I, I, IUPY, like, like a lot of the, all the state schools, and then, and then UCLA. But I mean, that was, I mean, the cost for being out of state and something like that was ridiculous. My parents wanted me to go to St. Joe's. I did get into St. Joseph, which is now gone, which is a Catholic school up in Rensselaer that closed like last year. There was like $30,000 a year and they were willing, they were willing to do it. But then my sister was two years behind me to come through school. And none of these places gave me as good a, good a education or a good a scholarships for it. And Ball State really did, then as now. And I know that probably, you know, I'm obviously biased, but they really do have the best media program. So I thought it would be better to prepare me for what I wanted to do. Did you did you have to mostly fund your college education by yourself? Or no, you no, said th your parents saved money. They, 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 they were able to cover everything in college in terms of books, in terms of... Um, tuition, uh, they had money reserved if I wanted to go to the dorms, but they basically, they basically said, here's what we have, so he, we got to figure out a way to make this work, or you're going to have to do something else. I wanted to move out. There's a couple other things I wanted to do, so I, I took out some loans to help sort of support that, but it wasn't, I never had, like I think I graduated with $10,000 worth of debt that I had paid off in two years, which was not, I mean, at the time, it was a lot, but like now that's like... That's nothing, you know. But no, they, they, they ended up paying for most of it. And then, of course, the scholarships help. And when you were applying for Ball State, did you know you wanted to be in the Honors College program? And how did that come about? Yeah, so uh, I had a, one of the counselors at Yorktown recommended it. And then we went in that summer. My mo mom and I went to, um, there was like a call-out meeting or like a, something that said, if you were interested in going to the Honors College, you meet these criteria. And I went, and it just seemed, I have always been interested in history. And what I appreciate about the Honors College then as now is that there, there is a strong, the option is there for a strong history focus. And so a lot of the professors when I got into the Honors College were, were like history folks. And I chose a lot of that, but I think it helped shape everything. But there was, it was coincided with my intellectual interests, I think. Was there an aspect or a part of history that particularly interested you or just in general history? I think it's just in general. I just like the subject and I think it, 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 is, it is a better way to explore and look at human behavior than through sociology or psychology. And I know a psychologist or a sociologist would slap me for saying that, but I think, you know, to you, so I'm going to use you as an example. The reason that I keep asking you or you to come on immersion projects is because you have demonstrated for years 
of how talented you are. So like your past behavior, I can't say with any certainty that you'll do great, but I know that because you have in the past, it says that Jocelyn is capable of doing this next thing. And so uh, I think in a larger, you know, to understand how a population or a group of people or a country is going to do something by looking at what has been done in the past is a good way to sort of analyze that and predict that. What were your interactions with the honors uh, curriculum your freshman year? So I, I, I really do not remember the courses and the individual courses, but I do remember specific professors. So I re, um, and a lot of them were were history professors, and so I that's that's what I remember. And I remember and uh, uh, Daniel Goffman, which is he's no longer here, but he taught it's like three courses: two hundred one, two hundred two, and two hundred three. I don't know if that's right or not, but like. They were sort of like the foundational stuff, and Goffman was there through all of that. So all the, all three of those classes have like, in my brain, merged together in one. But he did a lot of the history stuff and explored how it interacts with issues of race and culture and just the understanding of the United States, and then just the other professors, I think, really. And that was that way all the way through my, my freshman. And then I don't know that I really took that many classes. I think I was pretty much done by my junior year for honors courses other than my um, creative project. Do you remember any particular assignments that you really liked from him or is it blurry? No, I just remember a lot of papers. And so what I, what I, I think a lot of my writing improved because of Goffman, because and he was like really open into taking, now he was kind of a hard ass when it came to like being correct on grammar and all that. But he, you could write about anything you wanted. It had to be within the confines of what he was saying, but I could blend history with modern culture. And even now, looking back, there were probably loony ideas. He tolerated that in a creative way because that was the purpose, was just to get the class to write about something and to think about it, even if it wasn't really always like the right or correct way to do it. Were those classes easy to jump into, like from high school to yeah. those types? Yeah, and I thought I thought the honors stuff at Yorktown prepared me well for that. And so there's a lot of open discussion, a lot of arguments, but good, in a good way, and a lot of reading, a lot of writing that I think is there for a particular kind of student that I think I was well prepared to, to, to handle. What what was your social life? I know I already asked you about this for high school, but what, what did you... Do like did you ever prank people? What did you do for fun? Tell me about that. Um, I don't remember pranking people. I remember a lot of drinking. I mean, to be completely honest, I I mean not like I don't think in a gross way. I but I remember I had friends from Yorktown that were a year ahead of me, and they goes that goes all the way back to St. Mary. So there was there was a group of people, boys, mostly men, that were a, a year ahead of me. And we were just always close all through Yorktown. They lived on the uh, by the white spot laundry mat, and so Marv, my roommate, we would go and we would do our laundry. So we would pop it in, then we would go over to their house, and they were all twenty one. And then they would we would we would give them money, and they would go out and buy us a week's supply of booze. And then I mean that was just our routine for like, and then we they would either come over or. Um, you know, we just we just hung out. We'd go to movies. We went to Indianapolis a lot. You know, so I don't know that we did not while drinking, but like uh, you know, I think probably pretty normal college stuff. What was Muncie like in that time? What was there to do? Uh, there wasn't a lot. So downtown was a shithole at that time. I mean, it's and that's what it's hard to it's hard to look at it now because you go to downtown now and it's amazing. But in the in the late '90s and the early aughts, it was it was really bad. And there's just nothing down there. The Harat was the only thing that was down there. And then the village was there, but I've never been a, even now. It's like sticky floors and like brotastic. And it, it's just like, it's never really been my scene. But there, there was BW3s, which is now by the mall was, was, was downtown or in the village. So it was kind of low key. Um, but that was it. There were more movie theaters. So we, I went to a lot more movies, I think. In college than I did probably even now simply because there was just more options. Do you remember how much the movies costed? I know the AMC now is crazy. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's crazy. So yeah, it was like five or six bucks. There was also a dollar theater for a while where Ruby Tuesdays is and so like we would go and watch 
you know, second run movies because they were they were cheap to go to. And can you just reiterate what years you were at Ball State? Uh, fall of ninety nine through summer of two thousand three. Were there that that was right during nine eleven then? Mm-hmm. Do you remember where you were at that time? Yeah. So I had a there was um, this is a former state rep for us it was a band no a former c- congressional rep. It was a man by the name of David McIntosh, and kind of a right leaning guy. I actually saw him on on Fox News. That's not true. Fox Business when I was on vacation a week ago. It was, Odd. But anyways, he taught an economics class. So when 9-11 was happening, when the, when the first plane hit, I was there in that class. Nothing was said. It was like early, like eight. Then I come here to a, it was a, non, a non-honors course it was taught by Kevin Smith. And it was just like the history of the United States or something like that. And we were, we were about to the time where we were talking about Pearl Harbor. And he's talking about a plane that hit the building and all that. And I thought it was not a joke, but I thought he was explaining what a what a Pearl Harbor would be for like us. So I thought it was like a, an analogy of sorts, like a metaphor and he was explaining planes, but then he kept going and going and going and going and it's like, "Oh shit, this really happened." And so um and then we were done with that. We just spent the whole time talking about that. And then I went over to Stan Soller's audio class and he had canceled class, but mostly because he was on the radio announcing the news. And then for the rest of the day, we just watched um, television in the classrooms. I mean, like pretty much the campus shut down, and we just we just paid attention to just what was going on. So, so he didn't really. The first professor did not cancel class. Well, he didn't know. So it, it, this was happening. We had no idea this was going on. So now you, you you know like my mom would be texting me or like you know be like holy shit you see what's going on in New York, but like this was not everyone. Ha- it, per- cell phones were just not that pervasive. And it was, it was just a different time. So it was like an eight o'clock class by the time we got out of it. And then like no one said anything on the walk over from, from the Whittinger building to here until Kevin Smith said it. And then even then no one really believed it. So like it was just as it was unfolding, the day was, was unfolding. But then, you know, by the time late morning and afternoon, like that's just the only thing anybody was discussing. How did that affect your time? Because you had two more years after that. Uh, I mean, it was. I rem. I. It was. I think. I thought it was going to be. In retrospect, I thought it was going to be like World War II, and I'm sure that's how the government was trying to. I know that's how the government was trying to present it, but it wasn't. So I remember being ardently supportive of the war in Iraq, which now it looks like is a, to- is a total, to- like it was a total bullshit lie. I mean, like all the way through, it was not the same thing as, as the Second World War. But at 21, 20, that's you know I thought this is our, our Pearl Harbor, our World War II. So I think I was far more gung ho and far more conservative, during my college years than what I am now. So you felt like you were going to the war? You... No, I mean, I, I, I never, I mean, I thought at times that I should enlist, but I, I was never like, you know what, this is the thing that I need to do. And I was like, I never, that was never a real serious thing. But I was a hawk, you know, I was, I was someone that supported everything that was going on. And now in retrospect, I know what really happened. And you know, like it was far, it's far more complex than just what happened in the 1940s. Were there other big events like that that affected how the campus kind of was interacting or anything like that? Um, no, not that I remember. The bell tower had to be rebuilt twice when I was here. They, like, screwed up the bricks. I, that, I mean, probably, I mean, just in terms of campus, the um, the campus was kind of ugly when I first started. And by the by, particularly when I went to grad school, by that time, it was beautiful. And it's just that there were the the master plan that has changed the landscape of the of the of the campus has just made it an absolutely beautiful place. And that that really happened, or re- the major work started when I was here in the in the late '90s and early aughts. So then, like you said, it was ugly. What buildings did you kind of like hang out in that you say are not? So it was like before crazy. the student center was revamped. It was before, obviously, this building was revamped. It was Ball Communications, which has never really changed. Um, Letterman was not there. AJ was finished 
at the end of my college time and um, North Quad had not been fixed. The art, uh, the art museum had not been fixed. So like, like nothing had been really revamped. The teacher's college had not been fixed. So I didn't, we did not hang out on campus. I think I hanged out, I think I hung out more at the student center in middle school because it was close to St. Mary's than I did when I was in college. And it was just, I remember going to the Taco Bell there a couple of times in college and that was about it. Do you think that infected enrollment, like did you see it kind of increase as the aesthetics increased? What, 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 what increased? What like do the, do you think that enrollment, like student numbers increased as we bettered the school? Or I don't, do I don't it? know that, I don't know that they increased. I know anecdotally that a lot of people will say how beautiful the campus is. I'm sure it has some effect for the people that want to come here. Um, I mean, I don't, aesthetics are not the only thing, but I do think it helps when it, when your campus looks nice. Just like, you know, when you buy a house or do anything else, is an important part of it. Um, so just, this is a random question, but like, what did you eat when you were here? Like, what did you eat in the dining halls? Did you have a meal swipe? No, I did not do any of that. So I, since I was, I did not live in the dorms, um, I was not really part of the campus culture that is on campus. And so I think I probably ate a mixture of fast food. We ate a lot of spaghetti. I mean, I'd go days without eating. I mean, just because it was just, I didn't, it was just different. I mean, I weighed probably 40 pounds less than I weigh now. I mean, it's just, I was focused more on just like work and school. So. Would you characterize your time here as being happy? Yeah, very happy. I think, uh, I thought I had a great experience in TCOM. I think I had a great experience in the history department. I had a great experience in the honors college. Uh, I think I was closer to my honors college professors and the history professors than I was to the TCOM, which is weird now because then I work with all the, you know, a lot of the folks that I went through TCOM, but I don't, uh, I'm closer to them now than, than the folks in history. But, um, but yeah, it's a good experience. What, who are some of the people who you're still close with now that were there? Um, well, I, I shouldn't say, like, we don't, like, hang out, but, like, <laughs> I mean, like, I, I have, remember having s distinct conversations with Larry Birkin, with Kevin Smith, Dan Goffman, um, Tony Edmonds, all people that were in, in this department, and I remember having one conversation with Mike Spillman, like, I don't think I ever talked to Stan Sellers outside of class, you know, and I don't mean any criticism against them, I just remember... I think I had more of an intellectual interest in history, and so I could talk to the folks here, where in TCOM, it was more like I was interested in what it could do to, like, the technology, and I didn't really need to do anything outside of, you know, like, I didn't want to talk about audio with Stan, because I didn't care enough outside of what it could just do to be able to deliver whatever it is that I wanted to deliver. So would you say your true passion was history at that time, or...? I think my, I think my true intellectual interest has always been history and it was then and it is now it was in high school but like i did, never could figure out what to do with it other than using photography or radio or video or whatever to sort of deliver that what were the tcom classes like what, what was the curriculum so it wasn't that dissimilar to what it is now. You had like an, there was no gateway, but you had an intro production course and then you would, um, you choose, at that time you either chose audio or video and then you just move up. And then you still had the course, you still go through 408 and TCOM Law um, and then you'd have electives and other sub production stuff, but then you could also take classes that were outside of um, production, like your direct electives, just like you do now. So, I mean, it's different now that we added more multimedia. Um, there, there were no immersions. That, that was not a thing that anybody really did. So you, whatever sort of capstone project that you did, it was always in your advanced video course. And then the, there was about half as many production students. So now we have somewhere around 1,000, 1,200 students in TCOM, 800 of which are production. At that time, there was probably only six or 700 students total in TCOM. So it's still pretty big, but not, not as big as it is now. What well, do you say most of those were men? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was gross. I mean, it was like a lot of guys. And then, but I mean, there, but women were not, 
not present. And I think a lot of the women then that were in it were gravitated towards the news, if I'm remembering correctly. So there was production that was taught in news, but they were more, it was more that than like filmmaking or radio. What sort of resources did you have, like cameras and audio equipment, stuff like that? So I think at the time we had good stuff, but I think, I mean, now it's a joke. So we had, um, um, we, we did not have Letterman, but we had the, the editing suites in Letterman and Clone. We had, um, we used PD-150s, which were tape-based digital standard definition cameras. But, I mean, a lot of the same microphones. We had the little kits that, that, that were there. Um, we honestly did not start getting advanced cameras until, until my era, when I came, and then not because of me, but b because our just that was the time that we sort of switched to HD. So, what sort of projects did you do? Do you remember a specific one? Yeah, we did a documentary, or we did like a promotional thing for with Rich Swingley to do um, to get uh, the. Letterman building, so it was like a highlight of our program and what could go in there. It was given to this general assembly. I did a documentary on a magician in town, not a documentary, like a like a little like three minute, I mean documentary essentially on, on a magician. Um, it's terrible. What else did we do? I did one on the fire department in Yorktown, the volunteer fire department, and then a bunch of commercials. Nothing that I'm proud of. I mean, honestly, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think I produced anything in TCOM then that I'm, that I would be like, yeah, it might be standard definition, but it was good. I mean, it, it wasn't very good at all. So, what was the culture like? Because I know now it's sort of competitive, and you kind of feel like you're fighting against your classmates. Did you feel that tension? No, I think there were a group of people that. That's how you feel in TCOM, really. I just feel like there's a pressure to be like the best, oh. to be better than other people. Well, that did not exist when we were there. I think there were a group of folks that were more committed, and then there was everybody else. And I, um, I don't know. I guess that's not how it is now. But like, I don't, I don't ever, I don't ever felt like there was competition. There was things that I was not interested in. There were things that I did not have time to do. Like I could not be part of some of the like then it was like real deal and cardinal sports live that was where all of the the heavy hitters in tcom went and some of that stuff i just didn't really have time to do i was a member of cardinal filmworks but we really didn't do a whole lot yeah you said you were you were involved with cardinal filmworks yeah. what, what was that at the time so at the time it was what it is now it's just sort of a collective of people that wanted to make movies and projects and we would sit and and do that. And a lot of times we would just sit and watch movies, so like, and we would put on Frog Baby Film Festival. So now I think they're separate, but at the time it was all part of one entity. So do you don't remember any like capstone projects? Like this mm -hmm. is no. So and so I think that it helped me when I started teaching there because that was that I remember that experience that there was a group of there was nothing for us to do outside of the regular curriculum, and the problem with that. And maybe it goes back to like the honors college model that it sounds shitty, but like not everyone is really capable of doing it for whatever reason. They, they're not able to do, to travel to a, around the state to make commercials for the state tourism office. Uh, or if they get into, let's say, an accident and then figure out how to, how to figure it out to do it because without their entire world coming to an end. Or they, or they go and they get drunk, or they like do really dumb things, but there is a group of students that is capable of doing that. And so one of the one of the value of immersion is to is to take those students and give them a more appropriate opportunity for them. And that did not I don't think that really existed when I was there. It didn't really exist around the campus that I that I was aware of, other than having something like the Honors College that was it was always more academic than applied though. So you said that, that, that the video production department was like the best at the time at Ball State? Yeah. How, how did that come into play when it wasn't that, you feel like, I feel like you're saying it wasn't that serious. No, it's, I mean, but that tells you how bad Purdue and IU were. Like, I mean, and I still think Purdue, Purdue and IU have this sex of, the sexiness of being Purdue and IU. They're older, they're more prestigious, they're more nationally renowned. 
but their media departments suck. Like I've been to them, I've seen their equipment, I've seen their curriculum, they're just not as good. It was that way then, it's that way now. They are far more, in I use case, far more scholarly and academic, which is totally fine. And Purdue is like, we can build the camera, but we don't know what to do with it when it's turned on, and that's fine. So you're a high school student, you have three options. You, if you want to go into the scholarship side of things, you got IU for media. If you want to go build the cameras, you go to Purdue. If you want to make stuff, you go to Ball State. I mean, and then IUPUI is for like the runner up for everybody else. <laughs> like you can't get into those other schools, not to knock IUPUI, but it's just, you know, like the, the standards to get in. Or if you're a commuter or something like that, IUPUI is, is a better fit. Um, and then, uh, so it, it was way better then. So I just, I, I'm not knocking TCOM then. I just, I don't think, I think the, the students outpaced the the curriculum did not grow and at the time they did not have funding in the way that we do now so we the, right at the end of my undergraduate and then again in my graduate time at ball state we got huge grants in tcom from eli Lilly, two 20 million dollar grants and that's when things changed in terms of just getting better equipment and then when i started teaching there me and a couple other faculty members started getting in better gear and then started doing the immersions, and that sort of just all dovetailed into to the way things are now. Did you see yourself becoming a professor at no. that time? Mm -hmm. Nope. So when I I uh, when I graduated in two thousand three, I took a year off from college from college from doing anything. Worked here at the academy, and then Ball State offered if you just as they do now, if you are an employee, you get a huge discount at grad school. So I'm like, I'll just I'll just go to grad school and get that knocked out. And when I was done with the grad school, I was dating someone at the time that moved to Chicago. And so I was like, I'll just finish up what I need to do here and then move up to Chicago. And then I got offered a one year temporary job in TCOM in, in 2008. So I'm like, okay, well I'll just work here for a year. And then it's been like 10 years. <laughs> Like, no, I did not, I don't regret it, but like, I, it was not part of any plan whatsoever. It just, it's just worked out really well. Mm -hmm. um, and did you ever do any sort of freelance while you were yeah, in your yeah, undergrad? Yeah, and in fact, starting in, in 2002, uh, I started doing freelance for a guy here locally. He had a company called Indiana Films. They did not make films. They made commercials and like profile videos. The company is now defunct, as it probably should be. But at the time, it was really great experience. I got paid so I was working at Menards, but then I'd get, you know, a couple hundred dollars extra a month by, by shooting these videos and editing them. And our clients were like the sanitary district in town and like lawyers and like stuff that people that needed promotional videos or educational videos or commercials. What equipment did you use for those? Uh, it wasn't a Sony PD-150, but it was something similar. It was another standard definition tape-based thing. But it was from the school? No, no, no. He had uh, oh, okay. his own own fleet of gear for it. Okay. Um, and then tell me what you did for breaks and things like that. Did you go out of town or did you stay here? One time I went to Las Vegas, and I don't know why I thought that was cool, um, but at the time I thought it was cool, but now, like, I know Vegas is a shithole, but, like, I don't know, that was my junior year. And then my senior year, we went to St. Pete in Florida, and I don't think I went anywhere my freshman year. So you had extra money to spend on things yeah. like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then what about diversity? Was it mostly white or did you have interactions with African Americans, Hispanics? In, in like the university? Like, yeah. yeah. Um, in Muncie outside of Ball State too? Uh, no, I, I don't think that. I mean, I remember there were four African American students in the entire time I was at Yorktown. And then months, or St. Mary's was just as bad. I mean, in fact, St. Mary's probably had a better ratio, but only because there was like 30 people in your class, you know. Um, yeah, Ball State was better, but the TCOM was never very diverse, as, just as it is now. The honors classes were probably where it was most diverse. And I mean it in every way, not just in race. I mean, like, there were um, gay and lesbian students that did not, I mean, now I know like tons of people in high school, but like at the time, you know, no one was out, but like people were out in, in the honors, honors courses, which was really great. Um, you had people that were different religious perspectives, different political perspectives, and then different race. And I don't think that was that way in TCOM. 
I have not in locally until very recently. I've not done a very good job of being in diverse communities in in Muncie. No, it's changed a lot in the past couple of years. But how do you feel about that? Do like, mean? does it make you like sad, or like, do you wish there were more? Like, yeah, I mean, like, I I think I should have done a better job. I just don't think that I, I you know, I don't think the choices that I have made and the choices that have been made for me. I mean, I grew up in a white neighborhood. I went to white schools. I think it has given me a limited perspective. Uh, and I've tried to correct that a lot as, as an adult, primarily through my work with the historical society to sort of better understand, at least here locally, populations. I've done that in TCOM with women, and not that I needed to understand women more, but like trying to provide, using the privilege that I have as a white dude, to better make, to make better opportunities or to better elevate the folks that have been more marginalized. Because I think I recognize the fact at least I hope that I recognize the fact that I've not been, I've not been great about it. Did it ever make you feel uncomfortable because you hadn't been around them? Like when you actually were around no. African Americans, Hispanics, things like that? No. It's good. <laughs> the black community. So with the historical society, we're working to put the statue, I think I put it on my notes for yeah. Hurley Goodall. And I mean, the black community is great. Like they just, I mean, as, 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 not that I was surprised by it, but like it was, it's not been weird at all. Okay, so we're kind of going to switch uh, topics here. All right. <laughs> but why why did you choose to be an honors? Like, did, because it um, was it attractive to you in the very beginning, or did you not realize that it was until you actually started? No, it was attractive in the beginning. I mean, like they they made it very clear during those information summers, that summer before, or maybe the semester before, like in high school, was that this was designed for the intellectually curious. It's more rigorous but it's more open in terms of what you want to do. There's more exploration. It's less, not that there wasn't tests and those kinds of things, but you're going to be assessed in a different way. And it, it seems similar to the honors courses that I had in high school. And because there was an option at least to be more history focused, I thought this was perfect. And then at the time, um, I like I ended up getting a history minor because of all of the honors based history courses that I took for them. Sometimes there's like a the idea that like I'm above other students was that ever a draw for you to be in honors? Like yeah. I'm a, smarter than other yeah. students. Yeah. I mean I, that sounds really arrogant but yeah. like I am smarter than some people. And like I, I think you are as well and I think there is nothing wrong with saying and it's not a question of that I'm intellectually superior. Is the, above it. It's just that I have an interest that is intellectual, and a lot of people don't. And as you do, as you do, as like everybody in this room that has it. And so, you should be with those like people if it is of uh, of pursuit. The people that are into painting should be around other artists, and they are above or outside of or special from those of us that are not artists. So I don't paint. It's not that I don't I. I disrespect it, I can appreciate it, but I don't really care, you know? So like, if you're an artist, if you're a painter, you should be around those people that do that because I think that makes it, the experience better. Not exclusively, but, so I don't, I, above is not necessarily, I think, in terms of looking down at everybody else, it's just set apart. Set apart from the, from the group of people so you can explore those things with like-minded people. Did it affect your friendships? Were you mostly friends with honors students? No, I was friends with like not honors students. I mean, like I had I had a friend group from Menards, and I worked in the paint department. So, I mean, some of those people were intelligent, some were not. Some were not even college students. My roommate in college was not a college student. Um, I had a lot of friends from high school that were in turn friends from elementary school, uh, and then friends from like TCOM. Could you tell me about like the structure of the classes? I know you did a little bit, but so a lot of it was was not that dissimilar to now. You have lecture based courses mm -hmm. that that provided information about theory and technology, and then you'd have applied projects. In the non production courses, it was as they are today. You'd have lectures, you'd have projects, you'd have papers. So like four hundred eight, for example, in the law class has not really changed much in terms of their structure. The one thing we did different in the law class, it was taught by five different professors. So you'd go to a lecture, and each week there'd be a different professor lecturing, and then like on a, on a Tuesday, 
and then on Thursday you'd break out into your individual course and have discussion. In the law class? In the law class. So like it was before Barry. So Dom would teach and then Mike Spillman would teach and then a guy named Popovich would teach on like they like so the idea was that the journalism news folks could teach about what special what they were specialized in and then Dom could teach about what he was specialized in. And then we go into our breakout sessions, and then we would talk about more specific things. Would you say that was your most difficult class? No. Mm -mm. What was? Um, it was taught here, and I think her name was Mayeki. And she, it was a film class in history, and um, she was just tough. And I remember, like, I didn't feel like anything. Oh, no, that's not true. German was, was the toughest class, the foreign language. Yeah, I forgot. I took two semesters of German because I had to, mm -hmm. as everybody does. It was, it was difficult. What was that like for you, having to struggle in a class? I, I mean, it was. I mean, it's just like math. I just kind of struggle and get through it. And I didn't get anything below a B in any of my courses at Ball State, but I came very close in German. So. And how did like, did you enjoy honors class because of the discussion as opposed to a lecture? Yeah, and there was plenty of lectures, but there, were, but there were, because of the discussion, because of the focus on reading, because they were so open-ended to a degree that I could explore different things in writing and research that um, was supported by the faculty. And it wasn't, I don't, I'm sure I had them, but I don't remember a single honors test. I'm sure I had them, I mean, but I don't remember doing any of that. I just always remember the papers and the discussions and then the, the communication with the students and the faculty. And were you the type of student that was, um, that actively shared your opinion or were you more of the sit in the back I of the I mean, class? I'm an introvert, so like I don't think I was, I don't think I dominated the class, but yeah, I definitely, I mean, would, would voice my point, you know, or raise a question or argue or challenge someone. Do you remember ever like getting frustrated or aggravated? I remember in one of Daniel Goffman's class, there was a kid, and by that time I had, I had stopped practicing Catholicism. I mean, like I was not a Catholic. And I remember one kid was like, like ardently just like shitting on the Catholic Church again and again and again. And nothing he was saying was necessarily wrong, but like I was like, like at him, you know, like we were, we were in a, it was not mean, but it was, I remember really having a very heated discussion with him, and simply because I, f I don't know, I just felt like I needed to defend the church, which and nothing he was saying was, <laughs> was was wrong, but like at the time I was just like you know screw you you don't know anything about this. So you like to debate? Yeah, I mean not like in a formal way that, that they do actually in debate, but yeah, I mean like I I don't mind, I enjoy having intellectual arguments with folks for, at least at the time I did with for about whatever we were talking about. Do you feel like the Honors College made you feel more comfortable and at home than other classes and like able to share your opinion? The Honors College did not shoot, I mean at least the professors that I had w weren't quick to shoot down ideas. And even if they knew you were wrong, uh, they weren't They weren't like, I mean they would maybe eventually say it, but they'd let you go into whatever path because it wasn't always about the right answer. Mm -hmm. It was about for many, like, like creating formulating the ideas and the structures to explore and research more than it was about this happened on this date at this time and there's no other possible explanation for it. Um, could you tell me about a specific class that you were at, like a colloquium or any, any other topic in the Honors College? Yeah, so uh, Tony Edmonds, who's now some years retired, um, ha and I don't even remember the class, it was like on aging or something. And we watched a bunch of movies that had different depictions of age and relationship and family structure. And we read novels and watched and read, watched movies. Harold and Maude in particular, which at the time was shocking. Have you ever seen Harold and Maude? About this 80-year-old woman that develops a romantic relationship with like an 18-year-old kid. I don't even think that that's, it's not like child molest. It's not like a predatory thing, but it was just, it was just weird. And at the time, I was not prepared for the movie, like intellectually or emotionally. But like, I, it was that was why he showed it. So he was showing 
very different. The movie was made in like the 70s or the 80s, so it wouldn't have been like in my era anyways, but he did a very good job of looking at, I can't remember, it was either family structure or aging, but it was different interpretations of how the American culture, at least in the public discourse or through art or literature sort of explores that. Do you feel like the honors call or honors classes met your like intellectual ability? Like, did they actually challenge you, or were they still easy? No, no. I mean, I don't, I don't remember struggling in them, but I don't. I think they did a very good job of, of doing what I was there to do and providing the experience for it. And how did your honors call? Oh, I keep saying college classes affect your regular courses. Um, they didn't. I mean, I don't. I think I probably. In retrospect, I probably should have spent more time in TCOM, like doing things, um, because I probably spent more time focusing on the honors stuff. Like I, I remember writing and reading, spending more time doing that than like making stuff in TCOM, you know? And like now that seems stupid. No, no, I don't think it seems stupid. I think it seems. I think it from a pragmatic point of view, I did not focus as much on, I learned more and got better professionally after college and in grad school than I did in, in undergrad. Like I'm not, I don't know that anything in TCOM made me, in the skills that I have today as an animator and as a photographer and whatever came be, because of my practice after undergrad. And, and, but I re remember writing and doing the research and all that in the Honors College has absolutely prepared me for all the stuff that I've written and researched after the fact. Could you tell me about your, prof your favorite professor in the Honors College? Uh, um, Jim Rubel. He is dead. He passed away a couple years ago. He was the head of the Honors College. Um, he was like a, a, a taught in the classics, so history, I think, and then headed, headed up the Honors College. But he took us to Rome. I actually delayed my graduation so I could go to Rome. And then the semester before, we had a class on Rome. So I only had one class with him. But I mean, and then the experience in Italy uh, is just fantastic. So was he the dean at the time? He was the dean at the time, Okay. Yeah. And tell me more about that class. So the class was just, we read like Goethe. Goethe spent time in Rome, so we read that. And we read classics, and we read these like, like, like swarmy like novels that were set in like, it was just like a great blend of classics and stuff that was set in Rome, and then just to give us an idea of what it was. And then um, Rubel, I think his, his academic or scholarship was always on the, like the late Republic, which is historically what I'm, you know, what I was most interested in, because the Roman Empire was a republic, then a kingdom, and then so, you know, it was a very specific, and he shared that, and so it was just, it was just a really great experience. For no, I've never had any, there's no practical purpose for it, I'm never, I mean, like, I'm never going to be a scholar in that area, um, but it was just, just interesting, and he knew a lot about it. Do you feel like you just took the class because you got to travel, or were you actually interested Both. in... Both. I mean, it was like an opportunity to go to uh, Italy, and it was an opportunity to go into a subject that I was just really interested in. So was that the most close you were ever with a dean at the time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so he taught, um, and so he taught like a course. I'm guessing now. I, I think that it was it was his way to go to Rome. <laughs> I think he like I don't know, he enjoyed teaching, and he, but I think he always found ways to go back. And I think that that the class was a good experience for it too, for you know the opportunity for him to do it. Do you feel like you got close with him, or was it like did it stay like student versus professor? No, I think we. I mean, as much as much as that, you know, we break the lines in immersion. Like it's not not an, to an inappropriate way, but like more than what I would have was just in, in a normal classroom setting. And we remained in contact for years afterwards, up until about the time that he died. I mean, not like much, but like I could send him questions 
about you know where was Caesar at this time, and he would respond in an email, and he's like he was in Gaul, you know, like silly little things like that. And we met for coffee a couple of times, and um, and part of that obviously because I I was I stayed here, and so I could continue that those that that relationship. But yeah, I mean I I would not consider him like a friend, but we were we were we were acquaintances. What was he like? His personality. He was like he was very he was not very kind of soft spoken, mm -hmm. so he wasn't very loud. Um, but he was very smart, asked a lot of questions, very supportive, uh, very open to um, if you had concerns about anything. I don't remember meeting with him for anything specific outside of that course, but I do I do remember from that stuff around the course, like having conversations, and when we were in Rome, like having not like raucous parties, but kind of boozy nights, you know, at, for long dinners, having discussions about things. <coughs> and he just knew a lot about a lot. Would you say that he was sort of like a mentor for you, or did you have any other mentors at this time? I would, no, I would not say that he was a mentor. I mean, I think he was an instru instrumental part of, of the college experience, but I wouldn't say that he had a mentor. I don't know that I really had any. I had some in... in by the time I was in grad school, I did, and there were there were two professors in particular that I would absolutely consider mentors. But at the time in undergrad, not really. Do you remember any changes that he made to the honors college? Um, no. Um, not that I can remember. Um, and then was that class the closest you ever got to an immersive learning project? No, because we didn't. I mean, we each had to do a project. But it was sort of like, like whatever you wanted to do. So, I did a, I did a little, I did a paper and a, uh, some a photo survey of the Aurelian Wall, which surrounds the um, the old city. And I ended up walking around the old city a couple of times and taking photos of the gates. But he didn't really care. I mean, he he was more about the experience of doing it, where immersives are also about that. But there, it's a it's a whole separate thing that has come to be after my time. So there were probably projects that existed in, in my era that, that people would identify as immersive, but that was all Gora's era, and that really didn't come about to 2006, 7, 8, and it's been in the past 10 years where that's, that's been a thing on campus. How do you feel like your time as an undergrad here affected your life now as a teacher? I think it Electric. kept me in Muncie for many, I mean, it sort of grounded me within, within the city. I think that um, the Honors College was a great experience because it, it helped to, it valued intellectual curiosity for the sake of intellectual curiosity. I don't know that there, other than some of my recent research in history that has come from like just that experience, but I think it, they just valued intellectual pursuits because that was an okay thing even if it did not always have a pragmatic thing. TCOM provided all the foundation for all the knowledge, even though I don't think I got very good at anything in, in my undergrad, but it did, when I got out to start doing stuff outside of college, it did in terms of making, making me better at uh, camera and audio and photography. So what, did you take anything specifically from your honors classes that actually has helped you in your classes or you've integrated in your right. classes now? Uh, yeah, actually, I mean, the, the, the interest in history, a lot of the immersions, particularly before your time, were a lot, in his time, were a lot of history-oriented stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, finding things that had would have some connection to Muncie or the state of Indiana that were, um, that were related to history. And have you ever wanted to teach honors? Um, yeah, I mean, maybe. I don't think I really ever thought about it until you just asked the question. But yeah, I mean, like, if the opportunity ever came to do something, I probably would, or be interested anyways. What would you teach, if you could? Out of I would teach a class on local history, I think, just pertaining to Muncie, and I would then try to involve some media aspect to it, where the students could go out and do something related to... Um, creating photos or whatever, but I just thought of that like just now. So like I don't, <laughs> I don't know if that's something I would actually do. 
Okay, so summing up your whole undergrad experience, what what would you say was like the most like intense, scary decision you made, or like was there ever a moment where you were fearful of the future? Yeah, so I, uh, you know, in being from here, everyone I think probably has a love hate relationship with their hometown, and there was a, I always felt like I needed to leave, even like before I got to college, after college. And there's still times that I think, well, you know, I need, to, I need to get the hell out of here. And I was always afraid that I'd be stuck here. And then I'm not stuck here, but, like, I am here. So, like, at that time, I imagine being 40 and slightly overweight and being like, what have I done with my life? And, like, I'm almost 40. I'm a little chubby. And I don't regret any of the decisions that I've made, but, like, what if I had gone to any place else, you know, my path would have been different. I don't regret any of those choices, but like I do, because of my age, it is an appropriate time to stop and think about perhaps what has, what would have been, had I, and I think that was probably my biggest concern in undergrad. Where am I gonna go? Which I think is a normal anxiety to have. I'm sure you have now. What the hell is gonna happen over the next couple of years? And you don't know. So what were you thinking? What, like in your head, where were you going? So I had considered Los Angeles for a period of time, and um, uh, my dad was like, I don't think you're going to hate it. I'm like, you, you don't know me. <laughs> it's going to be, gonna be the greatest experience. I love it. He's like, all right, so go out there for something. So I got involved. I got into a workshop for the, it was actually my second time in L.A., but like the first time that I went out to actually explore it. And it was with the Directors Guild, and it was for like a week and a half. And it was a shit. I mean, like, I hated it. I just stuck in traffic, smelled. And I was like, there's just no way I'm going to do this. I just do not have the emotional bandwidth to handle any big city, but particularly this one. And uh, so then I came back, and, and it was a different... I, I, I had changed my perspective on things. And... Um, looked at looked at career in a slightly different way I think was that before you made the decision to do your master's that was before I made the decision okay. to do my master's yeah and then um this is cheesy if you could say something to your 21 year old self what would it be um to my 21 year old self to, uh, to don't spend so much money on dumb shit I mean, not that I was, I mean, I've always been very good with money, but I think I was very much concerned about things that just did not matter. You know, like like having a car and like, you know, I should have just lived at home all four years. I would have killed like a social life and certainly romantic life, but like I would have saved a lot more money. I would have had a lot more resources to do more creative things when I graduated. But then I'd be a different person, so, you know, who knows. But, like, I, I, I think I had different priorities that, that I shouldn't have had when I was 21. Okay, so you went to, you came back to Ball State. Mm -hmm. How did they get you to come back? So, I, when I graduated, um, I um, it was still working at Menards, and I was just looking for any job, and a part-time job opened up at, I was still doing freelance in the area for Indiana Films, and just, I had my own clients. So they're making pretty good money. And then a part-time job opened up at um, uh, the academy with the option of going into a, uh, a full-time job. So I took it, and then it ended up being great, and it ended up going into, um, a full-time position that lasted several years, also history-related, so it was just like right up my alley. And then about a year, I don't know, a year into it, I realized that Ball State offered really good benefits to get a master's degree. And then our digital storytelling program was relatively new. And so like, well, this is just a good fit. And I'll just go in the evenings, get my master's degree, and then I'll leave. <laughs> so, um, but that, that was just really sort of because the job because the job opened up and because of the job and the, the option to take the honors or to take the grad program. What did you do at the Indian Academy that was so interesting to you? So they, uh, the academy is a high school, supposedly, for smart and gifted students in their junior and senior year. And then uh, it's kind of fallen by the wayside, but they had an office of outreach that provided resources 
to instructors, high school instructors around the state of Indiana. Then they got a couple of big like federal grants to provide historical resources. And so I was able to write stuff, build websites, shoot video, make, make um, um, not really documentaries, but like educational videos, things that could benefit those teachers um, around the state and eventually teach a little bit. So um, teach workshops for the, um, the uh, academy students and it, it was really just sort of like wide open. It was like a very good fit. It was a really, it, the stakes weren't that high. So like it was a really great way to sort of work in a professional setting and to get to build my skill sets. Plus I was still doing stuff for Indiana Films and the other freelance. So I mean, as, as unsexy as Muncie is for our industry, I actually found a lot of work because no one wanted to, neither everyone left. And so there wasn't a whole lot of people to do this stuff. Where did your love for freelancing come from? Why did you do that? Well, I never could be, one of the reasons I always had a job, like a job that I knew I had a set income because I could never do freelance in and of itself. And it's one of the, it's one of the things I always try to caution all of you. You really, you have to be comfortable with an income that goes all over the place if you're only doing freelance. What I loved about it was because I had money coming in from like a job, so freelancing allowed me just extra income, but then I could pick and choose the projects. I didn't, I never had to do weddings because I didn't have to, but I could do a project for like water quality with a sanitary district because that was, it paid and I had the time and I had the equipment to do it. So then tell me what digital storytelling was. Like what, what did you do? So it was, a, it was a master's degree in um, digital communication essentially. And it was like equal parts applied, uh, like advancing skill sets on documentary filmmaking or short film and then theory. And then it was, and you could specialize, you could do both, you did do both and then you would specialize in one or the other all related to the film industry or television or just like visual or oral communication. So then now did you have like a capstone project or things? Yeah, that... well I wrote a thesis. So you either did a creative project or you did a thesis and I wrote a thesis. Okay. There was like tons of, by that time immersion was there and so we were doing more of those projects. And then um, I remember being very close to my professors and there was two in particular that I think I ended having still have like they're in, they're coming to my wedding you know like they're, they're like those those kind of relationships that i just still very much value are you engaged mm -hmm. okay let's just talk about that just for a minute cool oh you no no wait we don't want to talk about <laughs> okay um um yeah tell me about how you met her and all those things so her name is courtney she is a um uh, sister of a colleague of mine that I've known forever. I've actually known her sister more than I know I've known her. We were just friends and colleagues and then she had lived in Chicago and is just around. <laughs> so. Did you meet her through Ball State then or yeah, how did so that? Kristen McAuliffe is a comm professor and I know Kristen. She started a year after I came to uh, teach in TCOM and then her just her sister came down to visit, and that's sort of how that happened. You know Kristen because she came to our honor or our women's mentorship. Hmm. Okay. It's one of the you know the five hundred people that came in to talk. Mm -hmm. And do you plan on staying in Muncie with her after? I have no plans to leave. Okay. I have grown very much fond of the community. I feel that I am very empowered. I can do whatever I want, which sounds crazy, but like I am more able to do the things here that I've wanted to do all my life that I don't think I would have done any place else. And so I, I would never say that we would always stay here, but most of my family's here, most of her family's here are gonna, is gonna come here. We're happy, we make good money, I have a nice house. I mean, like I love my job, so like I have no, I have no plans to leave. Okay, we'll probably jump back into that later, okay. but I wanna make sure we cover this, the masters and stuff, and then, yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So in 2007, the Letterman Building opened. Mm -hmm. How did that affect your time? Because you graduated in 2007. So yeah, it was just never part of it. So okay. like I was just um, all our all our classes and uh, and the, um, the grad program were in ball communications. So. 
did you like watch it being grown and mm -hmm. you're just like kind of like sad just watching it being built? Yeah, I mean, I don't really care. I mean, like at that time, because my undergrad, they were building AJ and there was an enormous amount of construction going on. They were building new dorms, the bell tower came up. So and there was just like constant stuff going on. So it was just part of the Ball State experience that I had. It was just like the campus was always under construction. And then you said that you were involved in immersive, immersive projects. Did those ever like go beyond Ball State? Did you ever have outside clients for those? Yeah, we had one with the Children's Museum in Indianapolis. Um, we did one with uh, Minatrista here. I don't remember. I don't think they were that good, but it was it was it was probably like the nascent or the early version of like what we do now. It's just like you have an outside partner, and then you do some sort of media project with them. Mm. Did those affect your job now? No, no. I just other than just being able to connect and learn a little bit more about how community partnerships work. But uh, I mean, I think I've taken the experience what worked and what didn't. And the biggest issue was just that we just had by that point. The equipment that we had in TCOM was shitty. I was just outdated. So when I first started teaching, I knew I wasn't the only one that it was like, we got to make a concerted effort for new gear. And so I was digging through the daily news files mm -hmm. and I found that you tried to become involved in an election. <laughs> yeah. Could, do you want to yeah. talk about something to do with filing in the wrong district? Yeah. So I ran, I've, I've run for office twice. Um, and both times as uh, on the Republican ticket, and uh, I'm not a Republican, but in Muncie, the Republican Party is the progressive party, which is not really saying anything. It's because the Democratic Party is like a, an old school machine. And so I just I had a, like, I have a life's, life's to-do list. There's 20 things, and one of them was is to hold public office. So that was really all I was trying to do. So. There was, at the time, I was living in the second, second county district, but these assholes in the county building f had me, f they f had me file in a wrong district. So I had an illegal campaign, so I had to kill it. So it was like a, it was like a two day campaign. I still have t-shirts, like the vote from, Pe you know, vote for Pedro from the, um, um, what the hell is that movie? The Pauline Dynamite? Yes, and I just said vote for Fluke. <laughs> but then it was pointless because I had to drop out of the race. Did that affect your like social status? No, you super I mean, no, I mean, like I, I, it was very clear. I'm like, I have a life's to do list, and I'm going to accomplish as many things. Some of them are ridiculous, like enter space. I mean, like I'm not going to be able to do that one, but um, but like other things that I can do, and eventually I'll win some some election, and cross it off my list. So you still have plans to do that? Oh yeah, I mean, okay. at some point. Right now, at the historical society, we we have a policy of being apolitical which is good and I'm not really I have I'm liberal on some things conservative on another I think both parties are stupid frankly right now anyways but I at some point I'll run for something and God willing win okay um, so your thesis in masters uh, for your masters was the on the portrayal of masculinity in film and you had a solution mm-hmm can you talk about that? So it, was, it wasn't that I had a solution. In the thesis, it was the solution that's presented. Mm -hmm. And so I looked at two films, Fight Club and then American Beauty. And they both at the time came out about the same time, 1999. And they, they have this same message. And they have a solution that is an attempt towards some sort of enlightenment. And it's terrible. I mean, it's terrible. Like Fight Club is beat the shit out of each other and blow up corporate America. In American Beauty, it's have sex with an underage woman. I mean, like, it's like these are terrible, terrible messages. But I think, and not that those movies necessarily support that, but they're doing it and suggesting that there is a masculinity crisis, and this is how American, particularly white American men, go about solving it. And that's what it was, was just an exploration of the sort of, um, at the time, middle aged white male America, how they're being portrayed in film, and how that how the, the industry or the filmmakers or whatever offer solutions. So there's been a lot of talk about masculinity lately. How do you feel like that relates to the TCOM industry and how do you feel about all that? So like a bunch of things. So obviously like our industry has been shitty towards women. I mean shitty towards everyone that is not white and male. 
and a lot of what's coming out with the Me Too movement is dealing specifically with sex, but in a larger, the larger scope of things, it really is a much bigger discussion on everything that has happened and shouldn't be happening. And then, so that's one side of it, the industry side, and then it's the portrayals. It's like every hero is white and male, you know, like so the writing staff, because the writing staff is, or the depictions of women on screen are from a white, 40 year old's perspective, you know, and so, or the African American perspective is from, from that. And so there is a very difficult, but very honest, and I think go, ultimately good discussion about what is that diversity, it goes beyond just for the sake of diversity, it's important to have multiple perspectives because the country really is diverse. And to allow, I mean, one of the best movies I've seen this year was Us, I just saw it like this weekend, it was excellent. And it was from a non-white perspective. And it is just, it makes the, it's going to revive the industry by the fact that there are more women and more African Americans. And I think white men should not stop doing what they're doing. I mean, well, actually, they should stop doing lots of things that they're doing. But they should not feel like it's, it's, a, it's a, a competitive thing. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that J.J. Abrams has to stop making movies because Jordan Peele does or because there are, Catherine Bigelow wins an Oscar, you know, like there are, there is room for everybody and it's just gonna elevate everybody if, if there's just more avenues in. Um, so do you feel like now, how, like how do you feel like that's changed now and do you feel like there is more representation? Yeah, I think that there, I mean I've seen, this, the best stuff that I've seen is coming from people that, are, that have different perspectives or have different leads. And um, I watched, uh, binge watched over the weekend. It was a Canadian show by a woman named Catherine Reitman. It was called Working Moms. It was on Netflix. It was like funny, funny. And it doesn't pertain to me because I'm not a working mom. I don't have children. I will never be a working mom, you know. Um, but it was just funny. It was just well written. And it was Canada. It was set in like Toronto. And I, I you see more of that happening. So I think, A, it speaks differently to someone that would be actually a working mom. But... It's just the, the, the industry really is getting more diverse. And this bullshit about sexual harassment and all this stuff that has existed for you know a century in Hollywood now is being checked, which is absolutely fantastic. And there are certain kinds of men that are scared, and they absolutely should be. And I think it's going to fundamentally change the way we sort of do things within film and television. Okay, so now I want to kind of jump into like how you became an instructor here. Can you walk me through that time? So, yeah, so uh, I graduated in 2007, and I was still working at the academy, and a job opened up. It was like for a one-year thing. My f best friend at the time, Betsy Pike, was already teaching in the department, and I, Dr. Joe was the chair, and they encouraged me to apply, and I did, and I got the job. And so it was really meant to be for a year, and then they just continued on. And I continued on, and I started doing immersion projects in my second year. That went really well. And, like, I can do anything I want in TCOM. I mean, like, it's a great teaching environment because they are super open to coming up with new classes. Mm -hmm. Then I started getting more involved in the community, so there was more options there. It's just things really began to click in place when I started teaching. Okay, so we're going to back up a little bit. Um, right. Can you tell me about your digital storytelling mentors? So Dr. Joe, Joe Mashevitz, he was a chair. I mean, he was the longest serving chair in TCOM most of the 90s and then most of the aughts and chair when I was there. No, he was not actually chair in, in, in when I was in digital storytelling, but he became chair again. And he's just a good dude. I mean, he's just smart and he is knowledgeable and very supportive. And I still go to him with ideas. And then a man by the name of James Chesborough, who's now retired, he was the head of the digital storytelling program. He's just like super smart and knew a lot about the industry from a, from a scholarly perspective. But he was the one that encouraged me to write the thesis um, and then just sort of explore that side of things. And it was, it was great feedback to all that. So you're still in contact with him mm -hmm. now? Yep. And how do they kind of affect your career path? Well, so they, uh, for a while they were giving me advice. They both, uh, Chesmo encouraged me to go get a PA, sorry, 
Chesbro encouraged me to go get a PhD, and I and it's just something that I never I never wanted to get a PhD in communications. It just did not interest me. It would have been in history, but then I it had to like it take forever, and then I was just older and I just didn't want to do it. Um, but they were always very encouraging, particularly with writing. And then Joe, Joe understands what I'm interested in doing more. So, and Joe Mashevitz is here in the community. So like he understands Muncie better. So I can run ideas back him and he understands the reality of the politics in this town and then the nonprofits and all that. So did he ever influence you to become an instructor? Yeah. So he was like, we, I encourage you to apply. And then he was the one that, I mean, instructors contract, um, tenure track faculty, it's a committee and um, it's a different hiring process, but contract faculty are ultimately hired by the chair. So he knew me, so he ultimately made the choice to hire me. Mm -hmm. And are you happy with that decision that you're an instructor versus just freelance or out in the... Yeah, no, I think because I still am able to do freelance. And once again, I, I pick the projects that are, that are meaningful to me or I'll take on something that I even don't really necessarily get paid well or at all, but because it's good for my portfolio or whatever. Um, and then I can do the, the more creative stuff with all of you. And um, I enjoy teaching. Uh, and I think it was not ever planned, but I think it's a, it's a good fit. And then what was the difference between being an instructor and then now you're a lecturer of Tokyo? So the university made the, the contract faculty can be fired at the end of any year. And then there's a process called tenure, which you're hired and if you, you make certain steps, it really is a tenure track is hired to do research as part of, of why they're here. In contract, or only hired to teach. And then after usually seven years, a tenure track professor is hired like permanently. And then they have to do something really terrible or awful to get fired. And then they can move up and rank and other things. Contract faculty are like, we can let you go at any time, which is how everybody else works. But the problem is that there's uh, some departments that really rely on their contract faculty or that we're not leaving. And so the university wisely has put in a system where there is a rank now, so the rank for contract. Recognizing we can still be fired easier than tenure track, but we're here to teach and we're valued as teachers over researchers. Or, or uh, when our research is not at like, not over researchers, but like we have a different system of evaluation and promotion in the tenure track. So now, are you completely separated from the honors program, or do you have any sort of interaction with them? I mean, I, I, I talked a lot when Google was still alive. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but no. I mean, other than I have a couple of students every semester that are doing honors projects, and usually I like I'm an advisor for at least one. So. Do you feel like liberal arts is more important than teaching hard schools in your classes? You, liberal arts is more important than hard skills? Like I'm saying, like, do you feel like it's more important to teach students the, the skills, like learning the camera and all that stuff, or do you feel like it's more important to stay broad? And oh, learn I about? think it's more important to do liberal arts. Okay. Because, it, you know, um, and that's, this is a problem, and Ball State is not unique, is that we've, we've trashed the idea of what college was supposed to be, which was never job training. And I think it's fine that we include curriculum that provides people with skill sets you're gonna spend all this money and time. It, it does. It is of value to you to have something that you can leave here to help get a job, but that never should be the intention. Liberal arts is designed to make you knowledgeable of the universe in which you're about to inherit, and that should be our only goal, really, our our primary goal. Like we're not. Um, as an analogy, we should be making you chefs and not cooks. Does that make sense? So it's not so much that you need to know the order of things on how to do it and how to turn on the camera as much as it is that you need to figure out how to sort of be in a leadership position in the culture afterwards. So the fact that you learn camera and lighting by doing your immersion, that's great. But what I want you to get out of it is everything else that surrounds it and the story that you're telling and the role that that, that story can be communicated to the audience that's, that's going to watch it. And do you feel like that's even more amplified by the fact that technology changes constantly? So yeah. Really... I mean, like we get in TCOM, and I'm and I'm not uh, I'm not not guilty of this. I because we focus so much on button pushing that that gets bogged down, and um, 
I think that that is a mistake that I have made and others from time to time that we focus really much on technology when it's, at, it's, it's more about the peripheral stuff that really should be the focus of everything. You have a note that's being passed to you. I'm going to take a sip of water. Got it. Um, so how do you feel like the changing of technology has influenced your classes, like as technology advances? So I think we've made things, it's made things a lot better. So like we, when I first started teaching, there were no HD cameras at all. And this was 2008, and that was, that was too late for that. So I, I brought in, and others brought in, got grants that would bring in cameras. And then we basically just asked for a million dollars for new gear, and they're like, we'll give you 400,000. And that was enough. And so, you know, cameras like this is, is where a lot of that com comes from. And then, um, it, I mean, you cannot ignore the technology. You just can't. And so the, having things focused on that part of it is, is as important because you have to understand that the practical reality is on how stuff is delivered. It's just when that becomes the only thing, then, it, then it, I think it's detrimental. But it ha I mean, it has to be a part of it. I mean, I'm a gearhead as much as I think anybody else in TCOM. So there is a focus on lenses and formats and that kind of thing. Um, why do you think that immersive learning projects are the best way to teach students? Because it engages them in the community and uh, to quote, I mean, that's something that I've said in our class, to quote our former defense secretary, it creates unknown unknowns. So I don't know what the problems are going into it. And that's the purpose. You have to figure that out. So you get rear-ended on the way back from wherever the hell you guys were coming from. And that's a real problem. And like, that has nothing to do with communication, but you guys had to figure out how to solve that, right? Um, or that the, the client is shitty, or that they, it rains, or like we're running out of time for production, or you need the cemetery to look spring and it's not, or whatever the case may be, to go in and have to figure that out. That's how life is gonna be. And that's, that's what's the value of the immersive projects, is we don't know what the problems are we got to figure out a way to tackle them and solve them. Okay, so there's like a thousand production students, right? There's a thousand TCOM, about 800 production students. -ish. Okay, so how do you feel like it's fair when only about 50 or plus students can participate in immersive learning projects? It's not fair and like, like tough shit. I mean, like that's just, that's how it is. And it's not, we never, we never exclude anyone that is capable, but not everyone is capable. So there are, if it, is, it does bother me that you think that there are, not that you're wrong, I'm not saying that you're wrong, but it does bother me if, if there is an expectation that there is like, like, you know, like you have to like overperform or you're in competition because I see it as there's lots of people that are not capable of doing these things. That I cannot, I trust Selena to take out a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment because she's proven herself and she knows what she's doing. And I don't think that that exists for every student that's, that's there. There are students now that I wouldn't, I would be, I would not let them take out the cheap, you know, like, like crappy stuff that we have because they're just not capable of doing it. For whatever reason, maybe they're just not mature enough, maybe they don't have the skill set, maybe they're not willing to put the time into doing it. Where I could trust you to drive up and your peers to drive up to northern Indiana and shoot something with a hundred thousand dollar gear, come back and not make an ass of yourself, not embarrass yourself and do fine. That's, it's not exactly fair, but I don't think everyone is really at the same level. And so immersive is one type of learning. We provide other opportunities for those that are, that are not really able to do it. So then how does that affect your teaching style? Like what, what is your goal for students post-graduation? I want you all, my, my dream was for you all to stay in Indiana and to restart a film industry here or restart, to create one, because there doesn't want the one that does not exist, and change the perspective of how our, our, our country sees itself. That would be my dream goal is for you all to do that, but that's not a realistic goal. So, like, you're not, you're going to, you'd suffer <laughs> for a decade doing shitty work that you didn't want to do. So the, the more realistic goal is for you to go out into whatever world that you want to go into, whatever place in the country that you want to go into, and you just thrive in it. And not just, and you think about career not so much in terms of commercial success, but what problems am I able to solve with 
the ability that I have. So going back to like us with Jordan Peele or any, Get Out or any of the movies, he's trying to address race in this country. That has not been addressed before. Movies is just, a film is just one way to do it. So if that is, if that is a perspective in the way that you, that you can explore those ideas or better tackle them or call attention to them, then go do that in whatever place that you can, that you can do it. So I know that you've done a lot of projects in Muncie. Why, why stay here? Why is it important to make projects that are about Muncie? Well, it's not there's why stay here. I mean, I grew, I've grown over the years to really love the community. It, it's, it's, I, if I go out and do something in Muncie, I can see the results and it helps. And Muncie needs me. If I go to New York City, I couldn't do the things that I'm doing now and my impact would be negligible. You know, like I would never be able to do the things that have the same impact that I that I can do here, and it's um, I think it gets it, a lot of times it gets crapped upon, but you know like being a big fish in a small pond. But there is some truth to that. If you have certain things that you want to accomplish in life, you need to be in the environment where that's that's going to allow you to do that, and it needs you need to figure that out as opposed to someone telling you this is the environment that you got to go into because they don't know, no one knows. So is that what truly makes you happy is making projects here in Muncie? Yeah, well, here? not necessarily projects, but like doing things that have some sort of meaning or value. And I like, mm -hmm. I like being able to do things that, that, that have a positive effect on the community. If I lived in Anderson, I'd be doing this stuff in Anderson. I don't think there's anything unique about Muncie other than the fact that it's just my, my town, you know, where I'm at. So can you tell me more about, I know you are releasing a book today. Mm -hmm. Can you tell That's me more right. about all of your... That's right, Jocelyn, I am. <laughs> <laughs> all of your different projects that you're working on right now. Yeah, so uh, I wrote a book a couple of years ago called, uh, it was about the Native Americans here, and that stemmed from an immersive project that I worked on with some students about the Delaware tribe of Indians, uh, the, the Lenape that were in the area, and I just I loved writing. So then I wrote another one, or co-wrote another one, about Beech Grove Cemetery, and then this one, I have a column in the Star Press every two weeks. And a couple years ago, I was trying to find a Halloweenish topic, ghost towns of Delaware County. And then I ended up finding like a hundred different like settlements, some of which are not ghost towns, some of which are. And so then the, the narrative, the, the, all my notes ended up becoming just a book. I, by the time I collected all this stuff, I had 30,000 words. And the publisher that I work with is, is not a... It's like a public history kind of thing, and that's right at the length that they want. Tons of photos, and then um, I just basically wrote it together as a book. So I know you also, with your Lost Towns of Delaware County book kind of thing, you're also trying to photograph all villages and towns in Indiana. So I checked out the Facebook page, and it has like a pretty big following. Mm -hmm. What do you do with that? What you see is what it is. So I, uh, I got a the website has been neglected, so I got to fix that. But the whole idea is to photograph all of the villages and hamlets. I mean, within reason. So I go to each go throughout summer, and I just go and I photograph a central commercial district or an iconic building. It's just a giant photo survey, and then post it on Facebook, and then people do the. I remember when you know Bob's Butcher was here, and like that kind of thing. It's doing. It's nothing other than just to celebrate rural and small town Indiana, and then the up, uh, website will eventually be updated, and then all the photos will be donated to the public domain through Wicca Commons or something, and then so it, they, they'll be available to anyone that wants to use them. With all of your projects, what which one, which one is most interesting? What what are you excited about? The thing that I value the most it was an immersive project that I did with students a couple of years, uh, some years ago now, um, about the Lenape that were in the area, and then the book, and then anything else that I really write about the Native Americans, simply because I think it is the most misunderstood, uh, maligned, and. Um, unknown aspect of this particular community they, and it's not Muncie's not unique it's it exists in, all across the United States we just ignore the indigenous experience and they're not gone they're just not here so the groups that were here I mean the Miami are still here up in, in the northern part of the state but like so we think that this you know like Indiana history starts with the white dudes coming down from Michigan or up from Kentucky 
and there's several thousand years of human history right here that, that it's just not really discussed or is not really thought about. And I, and I see that's where the biggest impact of what I have done outside of like just TCOM and media that has come from the stuff with the Native American. So when you introduce yourself to someone, how do you, how do you put it all into one title? I say I'm ruggedly handsome and now, I don't know. I mean like it changes and so now I say, you know, I, I teach at Ball State and then they automate, everyone in the community thinks I teach in the history department. Because you know, that's and they don't they don't really understand and I don't I don't know how to explain it other than I just like this is how the, it's media is how you do something or how you present something, but that doesn't mean that your intellectual limits are stop at movies you know like in the way that some people like cooking or whatever else and so the history in, in the historical society the work there matches my own intellectual interest and I thought for a while that the historical society was a shit show. It was just very, it was in bad shape. And so him and others, we all got together and basically took it over and have, have turned it around. How have you seen Muncie and Ball State change over your lifespan? I think in when, I, when I was first, I mean, Ball State has always been a major factor, particularly throughout my life, but I, it, it, it always wasn't. And so like 100 years ago, the university was not the force that it is today. It was there. People knew about it, but it was like, it was the factories and the, 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 the political system was far more potent in terms of how the community saw itself and how it developed. Now it's the hospital and the university that really, I don't say to control everything, but really push and drive a lot of stuff within the community. And I have seen that really grow from, from the 80s on where, where because that time is when all the factories really started to leave, the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. And so this is all that's left. And so we gotta re figure out how to, how to make Muncie oriented towards that without destroying the remaining industry that's here and pissing everybody off that doesn't identify with the, with the university. Um, so where do you think Ball State is going and where personally do you wanna go based off of that? So I see Ball State, that's why I, I really love the new president because I see him, he seems genuinely interested in the community for all kinds of reasons. I think Ball State is not going to succeed if Muncie is not successful. So I think they're going to have a, as they, as they took over the schools and other things, they had a vested interest within the community to make it better. And I think they will evolve in tandem. But there is a whole segment of the population in this town that is ignored. And it's, it's everybody south of the railroad tracks, the old industrial neighborhoods that are not part of the healthcare industry, that are not part of the university. The university has not done anything with. The city really hasn't done anything with because no one knows what to do. And so once that issue is tackled and addressed, and if the university can play a positive part in that, then the city goes through a renaissance in a way that uh, some of the other Rust Belt towns and the, you know, the more industrial part of the nation has gone through. And do you see yourself staying here too? Yeah. I mean, like, again, I don't know. I would never say that I will always be here, but I have no plans to leave. And so as long as I can do cool things and as long as the, I like my job and um, there's, there's just no reason to leave. So to sum up this whole interview, how has the Honors College impacted you? I think the Honors College has done a really good job of providing me with in encouraging the idea that uh, intellectual curiosity, intellectual pursuits are goals in and of themselves. Something that I think higher education has lost when we have gone towards doing something that is more focused on job training or exclusively job training. Not that it was never part of that, but like what the, what the Honors College exists for is for people to pursue the, the more scholarly things or the more academic things and the more intellectually curious things for the sake of doing it, it's simply because they might enrich your perspective of the universe or it's just because you enjoy doing them. And I think that that is, that is something that has become, become lost, but the Honors College has retained as a central component of its education. And something that I encourage if the people, it always pains me to see the students that drop out of the Honors College because it, it, I think they're missing a very important part of, of what we should be doing in higher education. 
Okay, well, on behalf of the Ball State University Honors College Oral History Project, I'd like to thank you, Chris Luke, for your time. Well, thank you, Jocelyn, for the interview.